All right, guys, OJ Lopez, FMU, and this week, we've got a little bit of a change to our normal format. Tony Bellagamba on Apple Podcasts reached out to us and wanted to know more about what it's like to become an exotic repair technician. So we gave him our story and a bit of our history, and I think you're really going to enjoy it, especially for you that have been asking for a little bit more about the shop. So make sure you tune in, drop a comment and like, and any questions that you have along the way. Move for me. All right, OJ, thanks so much for having me in here. Uh, love your place. Uh, you were just showing me around. Very cool. Uh, love what you've done and love the career that you've built. Love if you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself. And I know you and I know each other. Um, we do. Uh, and I, I think we haven't always seen eye to eye when we originally started interacting, right? We did not. We did yeah. Not. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, there's probably some people out there that think that me and you might probably still have some beef together. Um, most of that's been washed away, I think, right? The beef is squashed. Yeah. It's uh, like uh, Tupac and Biggie, West Coast, East Coast. It's been that, squashed. That is very much... Well, uh, not Tupac and Biggie because they, they're dead, but... <laughs> and it, that really just came out to, uh, I don't know, training fundamentals, training styles, uh, goals. But I, honestly, like once we got talking, it's the same thing. It's just... An apple and an orange, more yeah. or less, um, right? Yeah, coming at uh, the same uh, result from two different angles. Would I be wrong in saying that, like, you have a very much uh, David Goggins s mantra of working hard, and is that is that like correct or? Is yeah, that I like you to uh, like to scream at myself and, and tell myself and, I and, suck. And, and don't get me wrong, it. like I I do the same thing. It's just the for me, I'm very I'm lazy at heart. I'll be honest. Yeah. And that's, that's my biggest demon of fighting. And it's always trying to figure out what's most advantageous without um, wasting time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that being said, that's come along with, um, you know, people say stuff like trained hard, not smart. But um, I think that translates a lot into, in a different aspect, into careers where um, you're looking out there for something. And some people think, oh, if I just start beating down the doors. If I start going mm -hmm. after it, I start running it down and running my, and you can get a lot of places, but a lot of times you need to step back and see where, what am I actually after? Mm -hmm. like, what am I trying to get out of this? And what's going to get me there? Am I wasting time? You mm -hmm. know, am I wasting time? Is this not the most efficient way of my time? And both, both ways are ways to get where you want to get. And, um, I think both can be, but that sort of thing, while it translates into my training, it's also translated a lot in my career as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, experienced that as well, right? The, sometimes you just think bang the door, bang the door, smash your head into the brick wall until it breaks. Right. I, that's how I started in my career. Uh, I wanted to be in investment banking and basically put on blinders and just pursued that wholeheartedly. And then woke up a couple of years later and realized, I don't even like this. Um, so definitely your approach of, you know, the work smarter, not harder sometimes is definitely. I'm not saying it's go. all the time, but you, you get what I'm saying. There's always a place for both sides of this coin. And, um, and like I said, uh, I did a lot of the working, you know, sweat it out, work it out, keep pushing, keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I started making my biggest, um, advances when I started looking for the right people to surround myself with both, um, you know, uh, professionally and then people as, uh, what do you call it? Uh, mentors, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, that also had a huge influence on me as well. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so maybe you can talk about that as you're, well, I guess let's take a step back. So maybe you can just explain for people listening, what it is that you are doing today, what your career so is. So the, the, we'll the uh, most interesting way I could put my job is I fix um, luxury and exotic cars. You know, yeah. um, I get to work with some very high dollar cars, uh, talk to some um, very wealthy clientele. Um, I deal in that realm, but uh, by trade, I'm a mechanic, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a, a technician, uh, dirty, dirty job, um, blue collar job. But um, when you get down to it, at the end of the day, I'm just fixing cars, you know? Yeah. You were talking to me when you were showing me around, which, by the way, your place, like I was saying, is, is awesome. Uh, I mean, you've got 
what is it, Lamborghinis, you got a Chevelle in there. I mean, awesome. Uh, so you're telling me a little bit about how you're doing that, some of that, I don't know what you'd call it, like the basic type work, oil changes, typical mechanical work, but then you're doing a lot of um, fabricating as well. So maybe you can explain for people uh, the, two le the two levels there, if you will. Yeah, so while I fix cars, we also make cars more fun, mm -hmm. you know, um, both visually, both um, mechanically, functionality. Really what it comes down to is people feel that cars are kind of an extension of their personality. Mm -hmm. And when it's an extension of your personality, there's a lot of people out there that need to have something that's different than what everybody else has. And that's kind of where we come in on that side of the business is people looking to look a little different, people looking to have their car sound a little different, to be a little faster than the next guy. We provide those services um, and guidance as well. Uh, you know, I'm big on trying to guide the customer to the right decision as opposed to just saying, oh, you want to do this? You saw it on YouTube? Okay, let's... No, I really try to get to know the customer and see what they're actually after mm -hmm. and direct them into the most advantageous uh, modifications that'll mm -hmm. achieve kind of mm -hmm. what they're looking for, you know? Yeah. So, so you were telling me earlier that, you know, you, you don't just operate on, on these luxury and, and expensive cars, you do regular cars as well. And, and that's how you started. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the evolution? Cause you, you can't just, no one's going to trust you to work on a Ferrari on day one. You're, you're a hundred percent right with that. And that was the biggest hurdle and probably the most, um, growth I saw personally was, uh, I went to tech school and I did very well in tech school. And when I came out of tech school, um, I got into the BMW step program, which is an after program for mm -hmm. the most prestigious students that, mm -hmm. that it's a, it's a very rigorous, um, criteria to be able to qualify it for it because mm -hmm. they pay for your after schooling. All you've got to do is pay for room and board in whatever city they tell you the schools in nice. it happened to be Cleveland for me. So I went from living in Chicago to Wyoming for school, mm -hmm. Wyotech. And then I got into this program, which was then, oh, go to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And while that's all fine and dandy, um, the big hurdle with that was that they paid for your school, but you had to get a job with BMW immediately afterwards. Mm -hmm. You had three months to find a job. And if you didn't find a job within three months, you then owed them for all that money back. <laughs> but the kicker was, is there's no guarantee that you'd have a job where you lived. It could be anywhere and you had those three months to figure it out okay. which means you know i had friends in that step class that were from chicago that ended up in michigan that ended up in ohio um lots of different places pennsylvania and i got very lucky because you know what we were talking about earlier i started just calling the bmw dealerships in the chicagoland area mm -hmm. two or three times a day saying i'm a step pro student did very well. I live in the area. I'd love to work there. Anything you got, I'd love to work there. I just need to work there. And um, finally, I got a call back from um, probably one of the biggest volume dealers in the Midwest for BMW, which is Prilla BMW downtown Chicago. And that, um, that got me into the industry. And uh, being that um, even though I had all this really great schooling and did very well, I didn't really have a whole lot of professional experience and that was a huge learning curve for me so here i am a bmw tech you know uh, apprentice bmw apprentice and i wanted to get into you know working on cars but the problem is is i knew long term that i'd be doing something on my own eventually mm -hmm. but when you're young 23 no one's going to hand you the keys to their bmw and be like oh yeah fix this you know right. like going into a shop, like I just had a little small garage space with enough for like six or cars. And, you know, you're just not going to get that clientele. So what now you kind of have a, a bit of a, I don't want to say ego, but an ego to you that like working on anything that's not BMW is kind of beneath you at that point. Cause you went through all this schooling, you went through all this stuff and now you got to work on somebody's Ultima, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. So, but that being said, that's what you had to do, you know? And it kind of was like, okay, well, these cars aren't that much different, you know, yes, German engineering, Japanese engineering, American engineering, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, 
you kind of um, realize how many systems are the same, how many to the functionality mm -hmm. is the same. And that's kind of where the name of our company, Fluid Motor Union, came from. It's an old Bruce Lee quote, right? Okay. He, uh, he says, um, be like water. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Know you, that well. you pour it into a bowl, it takes the shape of a pole. You pour it into a cup, mm -hmm. flow like water, fluid, whatever comes in, we adapt to it. Mm -hmm. We figure it out. And that was kind of like the mantra the first few years, which, you know, working on that stuff eventually got me to be able to peel a few side jobs off, BMW uh, off. And that kind of got us into working on the luxury cars, mm -hmm. but still having this broad base of working on other stuff that mm -hmm. I wasn't familiar with at the time. But again, faking it till you make it, you know, mm -hmm. um, getting better. Uh, other people asking, oh, do you work on Mercedes? Do you work on Audi? Do you work on, and oh yeah, oh yeah. And that eventually turned into, you know, obviously uh, people with luxury cars have higher than luxury cars. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we work on my Lambo and being, uh, you know, overly confident, you know, I was, oh, of course, you know, like, yeah, we, we, we work on those, not an issue, never working in a Lambo before. <laughs> Big Lambo worker here. Yeah, yeah, right? Like, oh yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine, not, not an issue, you know, and, but just carrying that confidence over to the customer, kind of selling it, but doing a good enough job where mm -hmm. they go tell other people. So, and that was, you know, two years after we started, you know, dabbling. I, I still wasn't at the time able to hire myself off. I was doing this at night, right? Like I'd come home from working in the city, mm -hmm. take the commute back and then work at my shop for three to four hours on the jobs that had piled up. Right. Got it. So you're working at, at your shop in Chicago and then working for the you dealer. just had like, like we got working out of your actual garage at home or. Well, it was like, it was like a little, I don't know, industrial, you know, uh, one car, one, one door, yeah. you know, no exit in the back. Just, I could fit six cars in there, one lift and yep. just rotate them around and do what we could. And then, um, my mom actually at the time, uh, she was, she had a nursing business that she needed an office to have people pick up checks and mm -hmm. like sign them out. It was a, um, temporary nursing staffing agency. And, um, I said, Hey, I need this spot. Is there any like use you could have? She's like, oh, I'll take, I'll take the front office. So then, you know, you can, I'll just mm -hmm. put somebody there and they'll pick up the checks there and you could have that back. Cause it'd be the same. I'd pay for a retail spot. Mm -hmm. You know, you're out in the middle and it didn't matter where it was at. So, um, I got that little space and, you know, she'd be in there grabbing people's names and numbers when they were dropping stuff off. And that kind of turned into her enjoying doing that. And now I got her working full time <laughs> reluctantly, but she, she does a great job. So, but, uh, yeah. Nice. And so you knew you always want to have your own thing or were yeah, you? Yeah. My, so my family's background back to my mom, every one on her family side, uh, did very well. Mm -hmm. Um, white collar backgrounds, doctors, uh, business owners, um, you know, businessmen. Mm -hmm. And there was always that pressure to have to, um, follow that sort of career path there, mm -hmm. you know? And so because of that, I originally went before tech school, I went to, uh, you know, a four year college UIC mm -hmm. and I was kind of floating, kind of just like, well, I know I want to do business. So I'll take business courses mm -hmm. and I'll head down that route. But I'd come home every weekend and I was just getting into cars, trying to read as much as I could, absorbing information, buying a junker and, you know, trying to, figure out how to work on it myself mm -hmm. and doing that and, you know, using my garage at the time, my little, you know, house garage before all this. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, a story that might be kind of famous if you look me up is that my mom came home one day and saw a radiator, like draining out in the bathtub, like a big black ring around it. She's like, what? what's going on? Like, what are you like? And it's like, I'm sorry. You know, like I didn't have a place. It probably wasn't the best idea. I could have done something else, but that seemed to work at the time yep. for me. Hot water. Let's get the hot water. And uh, she's like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, I, I like cars. I like doing it. It's, uh, I was a big Lego kid. And I said, it's like Legos for me. You know, mm -hmm. like I like taking this stuff apart. I like putting it together. And she's like, it's like Legos for you? And I'm like, yeah. And, you know, I, I know I want to do cars, but I, I'm going to school, like a business. I'll figure this out. And she's like, why don't you just go do that? And I'm like, you, you'd let me? And the rest is history. I was like, if I can go to tech school, 
I don't want to be one of these guys that goes to school for, you know, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get this done. So I just looked for the fastest, best program I could find, which ended up being in Wyoming. It was a nine month, very intensive course. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into that BMW after program. So yeah, I think that's a huge, huge thing there that your mom was supportive because she oh, saw that, you know, you're, you're going down this traditional route, but your heart's not in it. And great for her to have the foresight to say, if, he, if his heart's not in it, he's not going to love it. He's not going to excel at it as much as he could if he found something, which he already found, the cars, that he's going to love. And he's going to put his whole heart into. So that's what a huge, I guess, advantage for you to have oh, that support. 100%. I mean, I would not be where I'm at without my mom's support. You know, like I said, I've got her working right now. <laughs> also watching the grandkids as well. Like it's... It's very much a mom and pop shop uh, in the most literal definition, mm -hmm. but um, I'm very lucky. I know how lucky I am in that aspect. And I know a lot of people don't have access to that. Um, but that being said, that support had a big influence on me being able to go after what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I love the humble beginning story of the radiator in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've been there. I remember when I was going out to get my first job, I or an internship, I took the train down to the city to walk into tall buildings because tall buildings is where people with jobs were. And I figured I'll just knock on a door and say, Hey, I'm here, hire me. So <laughs> I love the humble beginning stories. The, uh, I mean, look where you're at now. Right. And it all started with a radiator and a bathtub. Yeah. And I was telling you, like, if I had a time machine to go back and tell myself, like one day you're going to have $3 million cars pulling in here and you're going to be working on them. I'd be like, get out of here. Yeah. No, no way. Like, nah, but here we are. You know? Yeah, that was the dream. So. so how did you, so crossing that chasm, if you will, from working at the BMW, should Perillo, right? You have, uh, probably have, I'm imagining a salary, benefits, Good right? Salary. Safe. Good salary. I still don't make what I made there. <laughs> yeah. So you had, you had safe. I was doing very well, very well. Yeah. Um, and now, then you go do your own thing. Now that's a big leap of faith. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and yeah, how you um, finally made that decision. I worked at a dealership, so I got to see the politics and very quickly I realized there was a huge deficiency mm. in the customer to uh, industry interaction. Um, now, places can tell you they're watching out for you and they can have a good reputation, mm -hmm. great reviews. But when you get down to the mechanics of how people are paid and how, what the tech, the tech is solely relying on paying himself by what he finds in the car, regardless mm -hmm. of how the customer feels about it. Mm -hmm. There's, and they, they, they put steps in there. They have a tech and a service writer. The service writer relays the information and the service writer gets paid on what's sold and the tech gets paid on what he's doing. Yeah. So you go through all these little steps and by the time you get there, the tech is just caring about what can I knock out this week to feed my family? Mm -hmm. They don't care about, is this customer going to keep coming back from us? Is this, this going to piss off the customer if yeah. I, you know, give them a six or $7,000 quote on a three, $4,000 car, you know? Yeah. Um, and because of that, it was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's got to be a way to do this a little bit differently that can better help the customer and help the reputation of an industry that really it's got a black eye, you know, mm -hmm. it's being a mechanic is a dirty business, you know, and it's not, uh, it's not something that's going to get fixed anytime soon. Um, even with people's best efforts, it's really got to be kind of restructured before it's going to get better. But that being said, there's a lot of good shops out there. I see that that's, um, picking up to be a more and more, um, uh, commonplace mm -hmm. thing out there. Not, not super yet, but it is, it is starting to take a turn and customers are much smarter. They, they've got the internet, they can do research on stuff and they can find places that are going after these sort of ideals and trying to hone in yeah. on, uh, their, you know, their reputation and yeah. what they're doing with their business, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. So that's kind of what led you to want to do your own thing. That there's a better way. Like I, I saw the deficiency, so I knew that I could make money if I offered that. Right. Okay. Now I knew I didn't really want to be working for somebody, but at the time the money was kind of good enough where yeah. I was like, I could probably do this for a little bit longer. Yeah. How long? That was the problem. I looked around and I'd see these guys and I was young at the time, you know, 
between 23 and 27 is when mm -hmm. I worked at the dealer, 28-ish. And I'd see these guys who were the older master techs. And these are the guys, they tell you that the dealership that are really experienced and really, and they were just doing the same easy work all day because that's what it got. That's that's how you fizzle. Like the more um, status you build up there, and the more custom they give you, the easier stuff that pays better. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily make you a better technician. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they're giving all the hard stuff that doesn't pay very well to the younger guys who aren't doing a very good job on it because they're they're not experienced enough yeah. in it. And but these guys were getting beat up. You know, they'd be in their fifties and having back problems and busted mm -hmm. up hands and you know and every week it was a rat race trying to beat the hours you did from before and it just didn't look very satisfying at the end mm -hmm. and i didn't know if that's really what i where i wanted to end up so again i said there has to be a better way and if there's a better way i bet people would pay for it yeah. so it kind of led me doing side stuff and trying to figure that out. And like I said, I, I still don't think we have it all figured out, but we've got it figured out enough where people respect kind of what we're doing and mm -hmm. we get customers because of it. Yeah. I think it's the, the challenge that you run into, I think is what challenge a lot of people run into is sometimes in, in careers, especially if working for others within a corporation, let's say money and fulfillment smash heads at some point, right? You looked out and said, Hey, this money looks good and it's, it'll keep getting better. But at some point, I mean, look at these guys who are in their fifties and they don't seem to be happy with what they're doing. They're not fulfilled. They're doing the same thing over and over. And so that's I don't, what the word is courageous that you made that leap and said, Hey, I got to do something different. Even though, even though it's a financial risk. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't call it so much courageous. It just, when it gets down to it, I really tell people because like you're saying, Money could be one of those things, but some people get trapped in like, I want to do something I like to do. And don't get me wrong, I like doing this stuff, but really where I'm focusing in at is the reward I get out of it mm -hmm. with the skill set I currently have, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I, when it boils all down to it, what I'm really after is I like when a customer comes in here and is like, I heard you're the guy. I heard that if you say something is wrong, you're not trying to rip me off. And I trust you. And that's what I'm after in every interaction. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's better than the money we're making. If yeah. I have that reputation, if I can keep that going, that's really what I try to keep and hone in on. And while I loved cars, I loved doing it. I love the challenge of it. That's the vehicle I use to get me that reward. If yeah. That makes sense. That fulfillment, you know? Yeah. You want to be an expert in your field and you want the, the respect of people knowing that you're honest man yeah and doing the right it, it aligns with my morals it aligns with my beliefs yeah and i can go to bed at night you know yeah so that's <laughs> that's uh that's the name of the game for me what was that that actual point where you said okay i'm i'm doing it i'm going on my own right because that's a big decision and then you got to start thinking about things like i got a lease or buy a garage and things like that what were tell maybe tell a little bit about that yeah which, what um, was going that's, a, that's a good one um so there was <laughs> i was I was coming up really fast. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest master tech that they had. They gave me an apprentice, which they didn't do. I was 25 with an mm -hmm. apprentice, which that just pissed everybody out of the shop off. Like people did not like that. Um, they handed me the keys to their used car department, which was in a completely different building on Goose Island. Mm -hmm. And I was running it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had in and out $3 million in cars in there. I was taking care of it. I was getting deliveries. So mm -hmm. if you ever heard of like the pre-owned certified programs yep. where they take a used car and then go th through the check, like mm -hmm. we were running that whole department mm -hmm. and I was really young to be doing it. Um, and given this huge monumental, uh, um, you know, trust to be able to do that. And I was doing that for a while, did a really good job. And that was just, I was just going up very quickly, both, mm -hmm in respect and in, um, in monetary compensation. Sure. Um, and, uh, by the time, you know, I was there for less than three years, I was making over six figures, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that was cool. You know, that was definitely cool to be able to even say something like that. You know, I had friends going to college, not anywhere near that, yeah. but it was hard. It was a lot of hours. It was like, you know, 80 hour work weeks. Um, 
and I didn't mind, you know, I was just there grinding it out, punching mm -hmm. it out. And, but I noticed that my skill set wasn't necessarily getting better. I, mm -hmm. I really wanted to be a good technician who knew these cars, who could figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. And I kind of asked them, I said, Hey, if I book so many hours, if I do this, and that was what it was all about. It was about how many hours did you book that week? Mm -hmm. If you can book this many hours, these are where the top guys get. They, they consistently book 60, 70, 80, 90 hours. 100 mm -hmm. hours was like you blew everybody away. Um, if you could book 100 hours in a quote unquote 40 hour mm -hmm. work week, it was never 40 hours. You, you might be able to work 65 and book 100, mm -hmm. but um, that's, how, that's how the politics work, right? Yeah. And if you could do these sorts of things, then you're one of the top guys. So I said, if I can do these sort, if I can have, uh, two months where I book over 60 hours, will you bump me up? Will you bump mm -hmm. me up to that, that, that higher pay level, higher, um, uh, status level. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh yeah, no problem. And I did it. Um, I did it pretty, I don't want to say significantly, but like noticeably, like they knew I did it. Yeah. And then on the back end, they came back at me and were like, Oh, well you had a complaint here and you had this here and you had this here. And like, the stuff wasn't necessarily like I was green. Um, there's some mistakes I made. Everyone makes mistakes. I mm -hmm. make mistakes to this day, but like the stuff they were picking on me, you could tell that it was just kind of like to chop me down. Yeah. And to me it was like, all right, well, you know, I want to take on more challenging cars. I don't even care what I'm getting paid because mm -hmm. I'm making good money. I just like bump up my pay and let me work on the hard cars that you're kicking off anyway. And they're like, oh, we're not, we're not going to do that. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to figure this out on my own. Yeah. You know? So um, that was a point where I started trying to really figure out how am I going to, because I was already doing the work on the side, but like, what was the volume I needed to hire myself off? Mm -hmm. So I think I had it figured out in the next four months, you know, what yeah. it was. And we got there to that point, you know. Got gotcha. so, so meaning the volume, meaning at, what at do the I shop, need like to... At the, the, the side work I was doing, because yep. um, another big aspect of kind of like how I structured was like I was saying before, we're surrounding yourself with good people. Mm -hmm. Um, there'd be lots of times I noticed that people would see my work ethic and they'd kind of want to be, um, to assist in that or get something else out of mm -hmm. it. And I would, um, we would work together kind of in, you know, in unison, like to, you know, so that, that's how I got an apprentice and my apprentice at mm -hmm. the time, is my shop foreman right now. Okay. Um, so like I found some very good people very early that I could tell, like, you know, believed in kind of what I was doing at the time yeah. and wanted to be around that thought that they can get some positive out of it. And I've tried to, um, you know, have them come up with me, you know, take that loyalty, yeah. take that respect they've given me and give it back to them and the stuff I've done. And I made some good choices with that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of uh, friends. I've made a lot of friends that worked with me. My original business partner who I met in tech school was mm -hmm. one of those people. And um, he originally had left from Minnesota when he met me in tech school, saw what I was doing at tech school, was like, all right, I'll follow you. Let's go open mm -hmm. up a business. Now, he was from Minnesota and his family was there. And we were doing this for 10 years mm -hmm. before he got to the point where he was like, I'm having a kid. I want to be close to my parents. So I ended up buying him out, yeah. but without his assistance, um, without some of my friend's assistance from earlier in my life, like I would not be where I'm at, you know? Um, so that was a big aspect in how I was able to hire myself off was surrounding myself with the right people that I can kind of rely on to do the hard hours, to do the long hours, to do the building, the foundation of the business that would allow us to get where we're at today. You know? Yeah. Nobody does it alone. Right. And yeah, especially there's a lot of businesses that start by, you know, a couple people together in another business and they look around and say, Hey, I think we could do this better. And they both are like-minded in the sense that they both are thinking that and then they team up and go start their own thing. So that's cool that you had that, the support, if you will. Yeah. Like I said, it, it, it not, like most of them like have gone, like I said, I've had a few go different ways. I sure. have some people still with me, but, um, without everybody's help at the beginning, like I definitely would not be. And I'm thankful for the amount of time that they were in my life, the help they gave and where we've gotten because yeah. of their initial work. Yeah. Know? So 
let's talk about the, you know, where you're at today, right? You are, you were showing me around the shop earlier. You're doing these custom fabrications and you, as you were saying earlier, people's cars are an extension of themselves. Um, maybe you can just, uh, explain for people what you're doing in terms of fabrication. Like you were showing me earlier, some exhaust and like what that means and type of work that you're doing. So a good example is that Chevelle that I was showing you out there. Mm -hmm. Now it's a 71 Chevelle, um, came in here. It had a really big engine in it, a 454 big block that was giving him problems. Had it done in another shop, kind of not running so great. Wanted to know what was going on with it. And we saw, Hey, this thing's not good. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, you know, it's just not what I thought it would be when I went to this other shop, mm -hmm. what else can you do with it? Um, and again, this is the customer interview process. Like, what are you after? Like, what are you trying to accomplish yeah. with it? And it's like, well, I really want, you know, this badass car that people see that, um, that they think is powerful. Like, what's the number that, that you'd be happy with? Well, mm -hmm. I want a thousand horsepower, okay. <laughs> which it's more and more common now, but it, it's still a ludicrous amount of power. And he really just wanted to be able to say that he had a thousand horsepower in this car. Mm -hmm. So that engine went out. We put a more modern engine, uh, an LS Chevy engine, um, which is, they, they come out of a lot of their newer V8 engines mm -hmm. um, that they use in most of their trucks and um, sports cars and things mm -hmm. along those lines. And we basically have built all of the prohibials around it to allow it to make the power, which includes, you know, uh, making the exhaust manifolds out of stainless steel. And those run up to this giant turbocharger mm -hmm. that forces that air in needed to make the thousand horsepower. So we start like with a car with a different engine, and then we got to figure out how to put this engine in there, how to wire it up, mm -hmm. how to make all those manifolds, the bends. Cause when you're dealing with stuff like that, there might be some kits out there, but if we're going along the line, it actually might even be more profitable for us to just sell them a kick and kick it out the door. But I see a lot of this stuff, at least for us and mm -hmm. the stage we're at in our business as our chance to um, show the world what we're capable of. Mm -hmm. So if I have a customer that comes in that's looking for something like that and they're putting their trust in me, I don't just want to deliver a little bit. Like I want them to really love what they yeah. did. And, I'm putting my passion into thinking this stuff up and coming up with something that not only can he say he has a thousand horsepower, but when people open the hood, they go, oh, I believe it. You know, like, yeah, this definitely does. This looks crazy. And that's, that's the kind of response I'm after that I want to give the customer because it works out for both of us. I'm giving the customer what they're yeah. after. And I get to say, I built this high level, beautiful, you know, performing looking vehicle that um, does exactly what the customer is mm -hmm. looking for. You know? Yeah. And it was beautiful because I'm not even a car guy. And I, when you, when that hood is open, it looks powerful. It looks like something you'd see on TV. And, and you'd be surprised because there's so many cars that make power that don't do that. And not that there's anything wrong with it. There's mm -hmm. a lot of room in the hobby for people to go multiple different ways, budget builds and things like that. But if we're going to do something like I want people to know fluid motor union did that. And the only yeah. way that I can do that is by just keeping our level of quality super high in all the stuff we do. And again, that comes around to um, having the right people here, having people that like when I see a vision of how I want something ran or fabricated, mm -hmm. can they perform that stuff? So I'm always trying to surround myself, uh, especially when it comes to employees with people who have a better skill set than I might have in a particular area. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, when we were walking around, well, first of all, again, because I, I don't know cars, I always thought if somebody said I wanted to, uh, thousand horsepowers, uh, horsepower. I assume that that would mean you get the engine and you just drop it in like, and you're, because you guys are the mechanics, you know how to do that. But I had no idea that you are essentially building, I think you call it the frame, you're, you're fabricating the different, I'm using the wrong terms here, but fabricating the, no, you're, the pipes you're more or, or the hitting, exhaust, yeah. mm -hmm. like you're creating, you're creating, you are not installing. I had no idea that that was the case. And that, there's a lot of ways to do that. Like I said, some, it, if you look, and I'm not telling you too, but there's lots of rabbit holes and there's, there's places that can get you that power 
in things that don't look as impressive, mm -hmm. um, but they might perform as impressive. But again, this is our opportunity to show what we're capable right. of. So if a customer is bringing me something, I'm really trying to find the right customer that is going to appreciate that work. So there's a bit of an interview process. Like there's some people that just want, I don't care what it is. I just want it to be faster. Right. Or I don't care what it is. I just want it to be louder. They don't tend to be our customers. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, we, we tend to do this process where we kind of feel them out and see what they're actually after. And when I hear those sort of things, it's, if they're, if they don't care how the production, the quality, the effort, and you know, the passion that I'm putting into it, mm -hmm. um, there's probably a better shop that, would take their money and do what they're looking for. But mm -hmm. when I get these customers who could see that, hey, I want to do this stuff for you, but I'm not just gonna do it in a normal way. I'm gonna do it that this looks unique to the other ways that people might've built this car. Yeah. Um, but that being said, it's a catch 22 because if I believe this stuff, I do it, I have to deliver on it too, right? So it can't just be, you know, you want this stuff to come in and then you make money on it and it doesn't live up to the hype. Like mm -hmm. if they're bringing it here and you're selling them this, like you gotta deliver. So, um, that runs into a big, uh, issue with us. Like we definitely, uh, don't manage time on those builds that well, but again, that's kind of an industry standard builds always take longer than people expect. Yeah. And it's just difficult, small shop stuff, difficult, uh, you know, finding the time, getting stuff done. But that being said, uh, our work kind of speaks for itself in that realm. Yeah. It seems like, uh, if you think about the, the typical auto shop, right and you were kind of alluding to this earlier, you feel like it's churn and burn. Like they want to get you in there, knock it out, see you later, right? You seem to be taking more of a customer centric approach where you are building a reputation for quality work, honest work, and not just trying to, you're not just running it off a of spreadsheet and saying, how many hours can we fulfill? Let's get them in and get them out of here, right? And that's the thing is that it doesn't matter where you go. Everyone's going to tell you that they're doing that, right? They're going to say, oh, we're that shop. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> but the problem is, is that you can say that stuff, but then it's how that interaction goes. And I think kind of one of our strong points <clears throat> is kind of in my philosophy that it's not just telling them that, oh, we're not going to rip you off. We're, mm -hmm. Like you have to do things that in how you present the information to the customer that shows that we're trying to give you a deeper level of the information to help you make the best decision. Mm -hmm. And in that, it has to be transparent that like, we're giving you this information so you can make choices, so you can decide, and it might not be best in our interest, but mm -hmm. if you look at what we're recommending, it might not be cheap, but if you look at it, the, the things, the prioritization of what we're recommending things, how we're saying to do things, most people eventually, like I said, our customers, we have some awesome customers where they just, and they might've fought us at the beginning, uh, they might've mm -hmm. treated us like every other shop, but. So many people we've turned around where they come in, just throw us the keys, whatever it needs, whatever it needs, you know, yeah. I'll be back in a week, whatever, whatever you say, I know I trust you guys. Yeah. So many customers like that. And it's, that's a very rewarding thing for me that we've gotten to that point. Um, but like I said, everyone's going to tell you, oh, we're an honest mechanic. I'm an honest, you know, um, but it's really in how you take that interaction where you're conscious of that this customer is just like everybody else. Mechanics have a bad name. How can I show him? we're different, yeah. you know? And that's, that's, that's really the challenge for us is it's, we're not just fixing cars. Like our product actually isn't just fixing cars. Our product is trust and how we relay that. And if um, we're not in, and we're not perfect, but if we're not trying to take that into account at all times and try to put ourselves in the position of the customer, mm -hmm. how would they view this if, if we were in their shoes, you know, and getting service like, would they like the information presented this way? Like, how can we best present this where they feel that we're watching out for them? And it requires a little psychology, but um, I got a great team and um, they get, they're behind me. They get my um, beliefs and things. And mm -hmm. um, it's been a learning curve because what I'm saying isn't necessarily the most profitable way to run an automotive shop. And it's made for some very tight years. It's made for some um, difficulties building that name up to the point where you get people that come in and throw your keys. But there was a lot of like, just like any place dealing with customers who don't want to pay, don't want to do this, or, yeah. you know, um, but because of kind of where we got, we're just getting less and less of that now because people know what they're getting into. Like, we're not the cheapest game in town, but there's lots of people who would rather take their uh, Crown Vic to us, you know, their Ford, mm -hmm. uh, Windstar minivan, their Toyota Senna, like 
and you'll you'll see all these crazy cars in here, but it'll be parked right next to a, you know, Ford Explorer. And to me, that's a bigger honor, right? Because these people are walking past these cars that are like three hundred thousand dollars and going, "This guy isn't going to overcharge me." You know, that that's yeah. wild to me. So, um, but we've got to stay on top of it, and it's not something you can kind of sleep on or rest on your laurels. Like you consistently have to be delivering at that level. Yeah, I mean, I think it draws back to what we were talking about earlier. Like your business personifies your your philosophy, it should. which is <laughs> yeah, which is your drawing it back to the career, right? Your passion is the outcome and being known as the expert in your field, and you want money, you like money just like everybody else, but that's not your main driver, right? You're doing this because you love the outcome. You want to be that expert in the field. You want to be the guy that people know and trust. I think you were saying is you're actually demonstrating that. So what we where we started this part of the conversation was every mechanic will say yes, like we're the we're the honest mechanic and we're the one who is going to do the quality work. But the reputation is what really uh, sticks out there, right? Anybody can say it, but you're doing it to the point that you've actually earned a reputation for it, and others are essentially now doing the selling for you, where you don't have to be the one to tell everyone, I'm, I'm the honest mechanic. Other people will tell. And folks. it doesn't come overnight, man. It doesn't come overnight. And that's the hardest part is like, you're waiting to get there. You're waiting to get there. And even where we're at now, like there's still um, new challenges and new things that we're coming across that um, require us to step up and require us to yeah. be better and require us to, you know, because um, things don't always go the way you want, require us to accept responsibility even if it's something that we really shouldn't be responsible for, but we know sometimes this customer is in a bad spot. You can see how this situation went for them. If we just show a little compassion with it, mm -hmm. what's that going to be worth in the back end? Yeah. And in this day and age where your reputation can be ruined very quickly with, you know, a string of bad reviews or, mm -hmm. you know, some people getting the right group and leaving a bunch of bad reviews, yeah. something along those lines, you don't know. Um, you know, how quickly you can come down from that. So the real, the real answer to that is just trying to stay on top of your game at all times, yeah. which is easier said than done. But yeah. Well, that's earned you some, uh, some cool, uh, experiences too. Tell me some cool stories. You have a story about a cheetah. Oh man, man. I got like, a few. Um, yeah. Let's hear so some cool stories from the career early in our days. Um, I got the opportunity and you know, I'll just call this what it is. We'll call it a failed business venture. Um, but that being said, um, our reputation, um, not super early on, but kind of midway through our career, built us up to the point where we were doing some very, very interesting cars that other people weren't doing. Mm -hmm. And this got us to the point where we had some people um, who were kind of coming up 2011 in that whole Dubai craze where the world's eyes started going there. Yeah. Everyone had a ton of money and they have a lot of money and not a lot to do over there regardless. You see all these buildings and everything else, but um, when it comes down to it, there isn't like a big nightlife scene. You know, it's mostly mm -hmm. um, image. It's all about image there. And of course, luxury and exotic cars would tend to feed right into that, right? Yep. So that, of course, led us to talking to a few people saying, you need to get your business out here because they're just spending money like crazy. And got to talk to some of the right people, got to talk, which eventually ended up, come out here, let's see if we can get something going. Hmm. So um, this was end of 2010, I think, around there. Mm -hmm. um, I basically ended up living in the Middle East, Qatar, bouncing around Abu Dhabi and Kuwait. Um, trying to get a business going. Um, How long were you there? I, I, I actually ended up living there for about a year. Really? Um, like okay. <laughs> six months solid, and then I went back for another three months, and then I went back for another three months. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, ended up being a year total time, but over the span of maybe like two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, so very promising. We made a lot of headway, but we just kept fighting against the culture, which was very now. Mm -hmm. very now, um, which is very weird because there's so much infrastructure that wasn't there that um, they get distracted, right? So if you say, oh, I can give you this power, I can do this ECU tune, I can bump up your power from this to that, get mm -hmm. these parts. They're like, great, I'll pay you right now. 
well, I can't get the parts here for three weeks. Okay, never mind. And then they'd go buy a jet ski or a Falcon or, you know what I mean? Like it's a very, like they just want the image in the moment. And yeah. because of that, it was very hard to like get a foothold with what we were dealing with. Yeah. Now we ended up setting up some people that um, were selling some parts for us on the back yeah. end and they kind of got more established and some of them are still running to this day. But for me, it got to a point where it was like going to be too much mm -hmm. to divvy my time up when I was thinking about it. Like I could be here and I'll probably get this working, but I'm going to be away from home. And then what do mm -hmm. I have? But that being said, some of that stuff, just uh, the cheetah story, right? So we met this one gentleman uh, who ended up and without getting too long into how the culture works and the politics work over there, the countries are actually very small when you get into the citizenship. Mm. So you might see like Qatar has a population of 9 million, mm -hmm. but in actuality, how many actual citizens there are? Maybe 200,000 out of 9 million. So those are the people. And the way it works is out of those 200,000, you can't have a business that comes in there. Like if I wanted to open up a McDonald's there, mm -hmm. I could not open up the McDonald's unless a Qatari is 51% owner. Okay. So mm -hmm. basically these people by being alive over there have this. And if you're not, if someone isn't approaching you about running a business in your name, they're, the government um, gives out stipends. Um, if you have a last name, you got a certain amount of money per month because that's how they're really, it, it, it's almost like a caste system, but it, like, depending on how close you are, how up your family was, you could just be receiving a $4,000 a month paycheck for doing nothing. Wow. And for the people that weren't that fortunate, you know, the, the lower end of that, they would get into the uh, public sector. Mm -hmm. And they might not even cared about being in the public sector, but that's where they were put. So those people were then, you know, the government officials, the, um, you know, industry supervisors, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Because that country, the way it works is it's all people coming expats coming to work and do jobs and take advantage of yeah. this incredible wealth. But there'd be people managing them and the management isn't great. Usually what it'd be is a manager and then they'd hire um, a expat from like Europe or the U S mm -hmm. or Australia or something along those lines, Asia. And then they would manage a bunch of manpower is what they called mm -hmm. it. And so, you can see how that like develops into this like family system where certain people, but this gentleman was very high up in there. Uh, same last name as the Prince, which was one of the higher up ones. Mm. And because of that, um, he had lots of business dealings that just like, he had nothing to do with other than his name was on it, but just more money than he knew what to do mm. with. And, um, we ended up doing a few cars for him, but, um, one of them happened to be a Audi RS6, which is a V10 twin turbo vehicle that makes, at the time, it's 2013 model, made like 600 horsepower. He wanted to be able to do over his electronic governor, which was at 172 miles an hour, I think. He just wanted to be going faster. It was very annoying for him that we hit this electronic governor. <laughs> At 172 miles an hour. At 172 hour. miles an hour. <laughs> so um, he said, what can you do about that? They're like, well, we have an ECU program where we take the file out of the car and we can put another file in there that eliminates that, but then also bumps up the power. You have the, the turbochargers, which force air into the car, spin a little bit more, yeah. push a little bit more boost, bumps the power, timing, blah, blah, blah. But with a few other little parts that we put on the car, we were more or less at 800 horsepower. Mm -hmm. But that process didn't like, it wasn't overnight. Mm -hmm. We had to kind of convince them. And this is like I said, the three week thing where we're waiting for parts, waiting for yeah. stuff to come. So in that time frame, you know, he was just taking us around, telling us stories, coming to visit us every mm -hmm. day because they really didn't have anything better to do. Um, so he just, he, I think he liked the fact that he had some Americans that were doing some work for him. Yeah. So he'd come off and, you know, flex his, his wealth and stuff like that. And um, we're in our hotel and he's like, get down here right now. I need you down, down in the lobby. And we're like, oh, is something wrong? He's like, no, I need to show you something. And we're like, all right, we'll be down in a minute. And you know, we're at a hotel, come down the elevator out. And this is the W in Doha. So, you know, W is a pretty prestigious hotel. Yeah. Um, they also had like, uh, there, there's only so many bars that are allowed and they would just be beer, but like, <laughs> 
yeah. bars that are allowed in hotels only. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very like, um, hopping spot, you know what I mean? Yeah. So a bunch of exotics parked out front every night and he pulls up in his car and he's like, let me show you something. And opens up the back of his land cruiser and there's a giant dog cage in there, but inside of it is a cheetah <laughs> and it's got a collar and he ropes it up and like leads it off. And this is like a busy hotel, like, like imagine God. a busy Chicago hotel. But he takes it out of the cage, takes it out of the cage and oh starts walking God. it around. And we're like, Oh, like you're blown away by the fact that it's a cheetah, but it's like, are we going to get blamed for this? Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like we're the guests of the hotel and you're walking this <laughs> cheetah around like that, like trying to almost go into the lobby. You know what I mean? And yeah. they're like, if your name's high enough up there, like they don't mess with you. You know yeah. what I mean? So if you are like, I'm bringing this cheetah in here, like they might actually let you do it. You know what I mean? But he was like, what do you think? And it's like, oh, it's a great cheetah. Like, very cool. You yeah. know, like, what do you say? <laughs> like, some guy say? brings you a cheetah just to show you. Cool cheetah, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, nice cheetah, dude. All right. You know, like, so, like, as cool as that was, it was also awkward. But, like, he didn't care. He just wanted to show us his cheetah. You yeah. Know? So, but same guy, dude. Same guy. Another story. He didn't end up telling us, but his friend told us. He goes to a wedding. Or... So they're big into Falcons over there. In mm -hmm. fact, like the airlines, you can buy a seat for your Falcon. Like <laughs> what? Like that's allowed. Like you could put your, you, you put them on those perches and they'll sit there and that's perfectly normal. It <laughs> happens all the time. You could look up it on Google, people with Falcons sitting in, you know, first class seats next to them, you know, just hanging out. So as you can imagine with anything, you know, breeding dogs and stuff where it gets into the thousands. Yeah. They get into the hundreds of thousands for specific breeds and everything else. Yeah. So he, it, like, it's a very high sign, but like the people that were really into it weren't as into it as him, but he knew that he wanted a falcon, right? Mm -hmm. So he, I guess he's going around looking for a falcon and he finds one, gets it from this place. Um, and they, they can range from, you know, 5,000 bucks up to 500,000, yeah. depending on what it is, which is wild, right? But that being said, he picks out this one beautiful falcon, everything else. And his idea is like, I need it today because I'm going to a wedding tonight. Mm -hmm. And the way the weddings work there is all wacky as well because it's not like men and women. It's like yeah. the men go into a tent and hang out and do their wedding thing, and the women are in a tent, and then the two get married and then they go back. And you know what I mean? But it's basically just a bunch of guys hanging out for a wedding, right? Yeah. And he wanted to bring this falcon there. So he's like rushing this process, getting it. He gets his falcon and um, goes like goes into the wedding and like they're like they set up like rooms with like these big these big square seats. So it's all around the perimeter. That's just how they do things there. And like he's sitting there and I think they said he paid like ninety six thousand dollars for it and it just flies off. <laughs> gone. Wait, like gone? Gone. <laughs> Never Leaves. to be seen 96 again. Grand, like just gone. <laughs> gone right there. And like, he didn't tell us that story, but because we knew his friends, yeah. he told us that story, but it's just like, this is the type of money these guys had. And uh, Damn, I know, need some cheetah and right? fucking money, man. Oh man. <laughs> and just to be able to spend it. But that was the difficulty we were having there was that, you know, if you didn't have it now yeah. like that day, cause he wanted to bring a Falcon to a wedding. If you didn't have it that day, he was going to go find something else that he could bring. You just know what bored, I mean? yeah. So, but like I said, that ended up being a little bit too difficult to manage overseas. And I decided, you know, I'm just going to hone my craft yeah. here. So we kind of, I don't want to say, we didn't, I wouldn't call it pull the plug because we kind of kept, until we got those places running. And now to this day, they still call us for parts and stuff like that. But it's yeah. not a, it's not a money maker for us by any means. But yeah. I learned a whole lot and, um, very cool, very interesting story that I never thought I'd be exposed to yeah. when you're looking into like, oh, I'm going to be a mechanic. And like, here I am, you know, with these princes in, in uh, Arabic countries doing this, these crazy stuff, going to crazy events and hearing stories like this. You know? That's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. I would not think that <laughs> you would end up hanging out with cheetahs and falcons in the Middle East. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it's, it's wild there. And I don't think people quite get the culture shock, but big car culture. But the way they do business is just, it's, it's real hard for a Westerner to get in there and like kind of crank it out. Yeah. You know, there's just so many hurdles and they don't like what we we're talking about earlier, go in there, crank it up. But no, everything works in slow motion. There's a hurdle for everything unless you know the right people. Yeah. And you just can't have that American worth, uh, work ethic, get in there and get something going because there's people there in that, in the public sector that their job is just 
it's boring unless they're messing with you, you know? Oh, uh, you need, your license doesn't have this stamp. You need to go get this stamp and you can go to this building for it. And then you go there and it's not a building. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they would just cut, like, that's what they did all day, you know? So like, no, it, 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 it's quite, like I said, it's quite different than what we're used to here. But that being said, it was an incredible experience. So yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> cool. So, so what, uh, you know, what advice would you give to people who let's start with those that are interested in pursuing a career just like yours? So that's kind of the big thing. You kind of got to decide, you know, it, it'd be more difficult for somebody who's older to like jump into this from something else. Um, mm. because a big part of that is the experience mm. and because of the politics and everything else that you'd have to go through, even if so you, by some chance you did kind of come up and experience because getting the experience also requires working a lot of low paid jobs, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, although I did, when I was in tech school, I met a lot of guys that were in their early forties that wanted a career change that mm -hmm. went through the same process and they were, they were done. And, you know, um, mostly I'd see that in like the big truck diesel repair section when okay. I was going through the older guys, there wasn't a whole lot like the car stuff that we were doing, um, repair maintenance, that seemed to be a younger guys, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but, and I was at a disadvantage because I didn't have any professional experience when I went to school. And yeah. I didn't know that because I'm a college kid. I'm smart, right. you know, like these kids are just, you know, high school dropouts and what, you know, like, these are all the preconceived notions that I yeah. have that ended up being wrong because they'd been working for years at this stuff. And I didn't know, I didn't find out how much of it was I, I was at a disadvantage until I actually got turned loose in the forest because here I am coming top of my class, top of my class at mm -hmm. the step program in school thinking like I know everything and I get out and I just have master techs because you have to work as an apprentice for so many months underneath mm -hmm. somebody else before they let you off on your own. Mm -hmm. And they're just yelling at me every day. Just, you know, like it was rough, man, especially being like a suburb kid, you mm -hmm. know, growing up in the suburbs, just that, you know, like I said, white collar, suburb schooling, you're, you get thrown into this world where it's very harsh and straightforward. And, you know, they might be calling you an idiot 10 times. You know what I mean? Like yeah. stuff that you're like, can you do this to people? Like, what about, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and there was like a few periods in that first, you know, three months where I was like, did I pick the right thing? Like, yeah. is this really what I want to do is be yelled at, you know, like mm -hmm. by grown adults, like all the time, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> But I kept pushing through. I kept pushing through that. And that was a big, um, you know, point where I had to, like, think about things like, what am I actually after? Is, do I want to work on cars or do I want to get, use my skills of working on cars to get what I'm after, right? Yeah. And you can do that at a lot of points in your life. But I'd say the younger you are, the better. But because I didn't have any professional experience, even like working at a tire shop or doing oil changes, mm -hmm there was a lot that just practicality, like I knew all the, you know, oh, this busing system works in this car this way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is where, you know, uh, you have to time this motor up, you know, but like when they're like, oh, hey, uh, change this gasket that commonly fails in this stuff. Like they don't tell you the stuff when you're at these schools, they tell you the functions of everything and how to diagnose it. Yeah. But they don't tell you like, oh, this is leaking. Uh, what do you do when the bolt breaks off? Like, I, what do I do? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a rusty yeah. bolt. What do I do, boss? Like, it's not in the textbook. It's not. And then mm -hmm. they look at you like, this kid doesn't know anything. You know what I mean? And like, that was, that was like a big, like, oh man, did I make the wrong choice? Mm -hmm. um, but again, sticking with it, trying to get better and just, I don't want to say ignoring because I heard the guys, I heard what they were saying. And aside from the, aside from the abrasiveness of how they were telling me the stuff, mm -hmm. they were right. Like, I didn't know this stuff. I didn't know what was going on. So I had to like, internalize that and say, no, they're right in what they're saying. I might not like how they're putting that stuff, but they're right in what they're saying. I got to get it better. Mm -hmm. So if I would have had that, I might have not been exposed to that. And I think if people are just jumping into that, they don't have any experience. It might be difficult for them making that switch, even if you're doing your own stuff. The nice thing though now is there's so much information, even yeah. from when I was going in school, like you could jump on YouTube and learn a whole lot, a mm -hmm. whole lot about, um, common failures and things like that, that people could have a pretty good understanding, but until you're actually wrenching and doing this stuff, mm -hmm. um, it's two different things. So, um, you know, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about working with cars, um, 
labor wise. Um, it's best to, you know, get in there with the mindset that, you know, what am I really after? You know, do I want the money? Do I want the challenge? Do I want, um, you know, and, and you kind of have to see, cause that's going to kind of guide your path, you mm -hmm. know, and, and how you, how you go after it. And for me, it was going after it from a knowledge base size as opposed to like an experience base side, mm -hmm. which can work both ways. I've had guys I've taken with no experience and mm -hmm. brought them up to a very high level. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I've had guys with experience that come in here, um, and not be so great, you know, like they're too pigeonholed and they maybe worked for one brand for 10, 15 years and then they yeah. see all this wide range of stuff and they're kind of, what do I do? I'm not used to this. So yeah. like it's, it's a difficult job to jump straight into unless you kind of like map out how I'm going to get there. And if you're comfortable with being at a low level at the beginning, um, because if you're not like, it's going to seem real hard, real quick, you yeah. know? I think that's true for a lot of careers, right? You got to yeah. map it out. You got to figure out what the path is. And then you got to be willing to start on the lower end. You know, you're not just going to be, like we talked about earlier, not just going to be working on Ferraris on day one. Oh, man. Right? Yeah. It's going to take time. A long time in a lot of cases. And I think, um, you know, a lot of guys get into that thinking. And, and, and you know, I'll be honest, like, I dream vocations, but, like, I really feel like I'm living my dream job working on this stuff. Yeah. But a lot of people get in here and I'll take them on, I'll take a chance on them and they'll think that they want to be around this stuff. But when they see how difficult some of these challenges are, like just being around this stuff and how much care you have to put in, mm -hmm. making sure you don't scratch anything, putting mats down, double checking, you know, like when they see that the responsibility actually goes into it, yeah. they, they, they realize like maybe this wasn't what they were after, you know, right. like they lo they loved cars, they loved being around them. But then when they realize working on them is kind of a different animal, yeah. um, they lose a little bit of that spark and then they end up fizzling out here. So yeah. um, you just, I, I think the best way to cut through all that is decide like, what am I after in the long run? You know, and like I told you, for me, it wasn't so much working on like, oh, I want to be around Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Um, for me, it was. I really like expanding my knowledge base and then earning the trust of others and the respect of others. And if I can find a place that allows me to do that within my, um, you know, my morals and my beliefs, that's the most rewarding thing. And how can I do that with the skills that I have, which was cars. So I had to refine the cars to get to that aspect. Yeah. But for a lot of people, if they say it's money, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you could kind of, that that might end up like those guys who it was money they liked cars they got there and then they found out at 50 or 60 they were chasing this and now their bodies beat up their fingers are bloody their arthritis everywhere because they've been wrenching away and yeah. they're getting old and they don't know what am i going to do past this point you know what i mean um so like i said it's really just know what you're after what internally is going to make you feel the best and then figure out how that skill set can wrap around to get you to that point, you know? Yeah. No, that's awesome. I was going to ask, you know, what advice would you get for people in general? Well, if, even if they're not interested in this career, but think that was I, yeah, pretty much it. it. It does bleed over into yeah. it a lot, right? Yeah. Well, hey, this has been super, uh, super interesting. Learned a ton. Is there anything else you want to cover, share? You know, um, like I said, uh, I feel like the industry's got a, um, a black eye, mm -hmm. you know, um, mechanics, it's a dirty business. And for me, um, I don't think things are going to change overnight, but I think if a lot of people are kind of getting into this with the same mantra of, Hey, I want to be rewarded for a skill set that I have that I can still feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. Um, they can go a long way. Mm -hmm outside of the politics because there's every day there's more and more places that are like our shop that are opening up building reputations you know I'll, I'll always say our shop's the best but that being said i know there's lots of places that i'm hearing more and more of this stuff they're building mm -hmm. great reputations um, they're building good followings due to social media stuff yeah um, and they're expanding their horizons people are picking up on it the consumer is smart and they are um, it's hopefully going to change the industry for the better um, and like I said, I'm, I'm working on it. You know, there's only, 
a minute amount I can do, but I feel like if we're putting our efforts in to try to um, break down this barrier, this preconceived notion that uh, mechanics are just here to rip me off, um, you know, if we can do our part into having a place where people can trust where they're bringing their car, um, that's going to go a long way yeah. into changing things for the better. Well, you know? it sounds like you're doing a good job of it. All we'll right. <laughs> Last question. I always end with this. You might have heard um, some of my other episodes. Doesn't have anything to do with your career, or maybe it, maybe it does. What's your favorite movie? Ooh, right now. So ever. No, ever, and it is right now because I just saw Dune Two. Okay. And I was a big fan of the first one, like before everybody jumped on the hype because now the second one's out and everyone's saying, "Oh, it's yeah. such a great like." <laughs> I saw that movie and I was like, "This is awesome." And then I just took my kids. I was I was super pumped about seeing it. Um, my kids, like, they don't have a great attention span. I got four of them. Yeah. Uh, nine, nine, seven, five, three, right? <laughs> and that's, they just, but they like going to the movies. They like the popcorn. They like sitting mm -hmm. there. And I was like, I was originally just going to go by myself. But my, my wife was like, oh, I'll see it with you. Because, like, she watched it again, you know, knowing yep. it was coming up. Because I was like, I'm going to this movie. So she, it was going to be a date. And then I was like, really going to leave her, all of the kids behind, you know. They, they like going to movies. So I was like, you've got to watch the movie before we go, you know, and yeah. like you better sit through it. If you're not sitting through it and I'm going to quiz you on it, you know? Um, so that was a good experience. Like I went through it. It was blown away. It's excellent. Um, you know, I, I don't know when you're listening to this, but check it out. It was really, really good. Um, but, uh, yeah, that made me, uh, it's been one of the better movies I've seen in a long time. And like, I could confidently say right now that, yeah, the, those two movies are like in my, um, comfortably in my top right now, you know? All right. So, I haven't seen Dune. I keep hearing about it. And, uh, my daughter is interested in checking it out. Yeah, so it's, I'm gonna... it's worth checking out even if you're not a nerd. Yeah. I, I, I delve into that a little bit, but even if you're not a nerd, there's just enough story and enough visually to see there that um, it's just good cinema. You know, it's good yeah. cinema right now, and there hasn't been a lot of good cinema lately, so thank God. <laughs> All right, well, I'll check it out. Well, hey, uh, this has been awesome. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having yeah. me. This is a big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, best of luck to your ventures. Uh, I enjoyed you know, the experience and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll, uh, I'll see enough, uh, out when we're working out. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, officially, uh, the beef is dead. The beef is dead. Beef is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, All right, man. man. Thanks a lot, bud. All right, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video today. Make sure you check out Tony Belagamba's podcast on Apple podcasts. He's got lots of great information on there. If you're looking to find your dream vocation, or if you like to hear stories about other people who found their dream vocation. If you could, leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll be back to our normally scheduled program next week. Thanks for watching. Ooh, for me.